On the True Myth Podcast, I talk to experts, artists, and friends about the stories we humans tell, how we tell them, and where God might be peeking in to show us something deeper. We'll look for God in the craft work of generating art and encourage a more meaningful artistic engagement. This is the True Myth Podcast. Hello and welcome to the True Myth Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Nettesheim, and I am delighted, excited, pick your word. I am super happy to introduce to you uh, my guest for today, Jeffrey Overstreet. Mr. Overstreet, would you say hi to the nice people? <laughs> well, hello, and this is a, this is a privilege. So uh, thanks for having me on the show, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Jeffrey Overstreet is a novelist, a writer on the arts, and a teacher of creative writing, academic writing, and film studies at Seattle Pacific University. He earned his MFA in creative writing from Seattle Pacific University, and Random House and Waterbrook Press has published four of his novels, including Aurelia's Colors. His Memoirs of Dangerous Moving Going, Through a Screen Darkly, which has become a popular textbook in classes on film, faith, and artistic engagement, is available from Baker Books and would be, if I were king, required reading for anyone who has faith and watches movies. <laughs> uh, Mr. Over <laughs> Mr. Overstreet became an award-winning film reviewer during a decade of writing for Christianity Today. He has taught creative writing courses and at writers' conferences and retreats, and he has served as writer in residence teaching fiction at Covenant College in Georgia. He's an international public speaker and a blogger, and I am so delighted to welcome him to the True Myth Podcast. Boy, I feel tired just listening to that. Uh, that, that person sounds busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's the kind of bio you want there. That's awesome. Um, I was first connected to you um, after hearing a recording of one of the talks that you gave at the Hutchmoot conference. I think probably 2015 or something like that. Sure, yeah. And um, after hearing it, I was like, oh, I need to get this by guy's book. Um, I got it. I took a deep dive into it. I couldn't put it down. And that's saying something because I'm not as strong of a reader as I'd like to be. And it was something that challenged and was compelling. And it changed a lot of things and echoed things that God had been telling me through other things. And so um, it w it's a fantastic book and I can't recommend it highly enough. And in preparation for this podcast, I went back and looked at my highlights and there was rarely a page without a highlight on it, <laughs> something that I wanted to keep and remember. So that's uh, uh, that's <laughs> funny because so much uh, so much of what's in that book, and I think if, if your listeners check it out, they'll see uh, so much of it is in quotation marks. Uh, I really looked at that book as a chance to share uh, the wisdom that I have found in other books and from other teachers and from other films, and so. There are a lot of pull quotes in that book. Uh, so, so this is the secret. If you, uh, if you keep track of the wisdom you read and then you share it in a book of your own, people will attribute that wisdom to you. Uh <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. What's that thing Lewis says about uh, people who try to be original will never be it. But if yeah. you just try, try to tell the truth and, you know. You'll you'll hit originality without uh, meaning to something along those lines. Yeah, that's true. He also um, he also says that about art in that um, you know we refer to ourselves as creators, but in fact we don't create anything. We just rearrange things that God has made. So uh, that's sure. a, a good humbling statement, a humbling reminder for an artist. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably something we all should keep in mind. Um, and, and I think that probably it probably works in both ways. It keeps us from being too proud of ourselves, but also too hard on ourselves. <laughs> exactly. Well said. Well said. I may call you and ask you to remind me of that from time to time, but yes. <laughs> well, and it's on the recording too. So you can play this as your ringtone you uh, over and over again. So I realize that this um, story goes back to the very beginning, but I feel a certain kind of kinship with, some of the aspects of your story, um, and I'd love it, you know, however long or short, would you kind of share your story of what brought you to the place where you became a film critic and <laughs> someone who felt compelled to champion a deeper, more thoughtful engagement with film by it, by Christians especially? Well, it is a, a life story. This is why I, I wrote Through a Screen Darkly was to chronicle some of that, and now I find myself working on a follow-up book that, that fills in lots of the gaps. But um, nice. in short... Um, I grew up in uh, the world of Christian education um, from kindergarten through 12 and then on to college uh, in Portland, Oregon, and then uh, Seattle Pacific University. And uh, my family attended uh, 
very conservative Baptist church in Portland, Oregon, most of uh, my childhood. And uh, the prevailing attitude toward the arts there was that the arts were a world to be suspicious about and overly cautious about, and movies were to be avoided almost entirely, unless you're talking things like The Sound of Music when it's on television at Christmas time, uh, because the mm-hmm. arts were a place where uh, the enemy was at work and where people who didn't believe in God were um, uh, reveling in all kinds of excesses and uh, recklessness. And so uh, movies were frowned upon. And I grew up loving to read and loving to write stories of my own. I think I started writing my own fictional stories when I was six. And I loved bringing home books of all kinds from the public library, not just from Christian writers, but from you know, all kinds of children's writers, from Dr. Seuss to A.A. A. Milne to uh, Maurice Sendak, and then into Tolkien and Lewis, um, although uh, they had favored status in Christian community because they were professing Christians, of course, and mm-hmm. wrote, wrote theology as well. Um, but I was increasingly curious about the sort of dichotomy that it was okay for me to read books by anybody, but it was not okay for me to watch television or watch movies by anybody. Mm. And Mm -hmm. when I heard justifications for those things growing up, um, that it often had to do with the immorality on display in, in movies or in television and I got, I got to thinking, you know, there's, there's a lot of that in what I'm reading, too. And frankly, in school, we're being assigned uh, Shakespeare. We're being assigned uh, classic literature that is full of human misbehavior and, and crime sure, and, sure. and sin in graphic display. And frankly, uh, I was getting quite a bit of that from the, the Bible stories I was reading. Right, right. So that, 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 that conflict became more and more uh, frustrating and fascinating to me. Um, I loved the Disney movies I was allowed to see as a kid, although those were scary as well and often came from pagan mythology. Um, Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just became interested in that, in those questions about what is okay for a Christian to watch, uh, for us to pay attention to, and what's the difference between portraying evil in a story and condoning it or promoting it. And Mm -hmm. uh, since I wasn't allowed to go to the movies, um, I became fascinated with movie reviews in the newspaper. And I was already quite preoccupied with the blurbs that you would read on the backs of the books that I brought home from the library. I I thought that it it sort of became a a dream of mine to someday write a story that somebody else would write a blurb about. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So um, I think when I was a little kid, I mean, my mom has these these books I made when I was six or seven that have me writing reviews of my own books on the back on the back covers of these <laughs> stories I wrote. Um, I was fascinated by the whole package, the creative part, and then the critical part. And so when I discovered Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel on television, two film critics mm. who would sit there and argue about the strengths and weaknesses in a film, I had never seen anything like that. And I loved it because for one thing, it took me one step closer to these movies that I was so fascinated by, but not allowed to see. Mm -hmm. And secondly, because uh, I was not used to seeing people argue. I mean, I was in a community where uh, everybody was supposed to get along and you only said nice things. You know, the, the mantra, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Sure. As a matter of fact, I think Thumper says that in the movie Bambi, but um, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yep, yep, that yep. <laughs> that was a prevailing attitude that you that criticism, uh, debate, was a sign that something was wrong with people, that that was mm. being mean or angry. But Siskel and Ebert could have these heated discussions about movies, and it was at least the illusion was for us in the television audience that they were friends, that they respected each other and that they could disagree Mm -hmm. on something being different people and then leave the question open for the audience to decide for themselves and move on. And that was different than the sort of moralistic, there's always a right and always a wrong in everything that I was learning in church. Mm -hmm. So 
that was um, my education in early education and criticism. Uh, and then later, uh, reading reviews voraciously, writing reviews of everything that I listened to and read and watched uh, when I finally had the freedom to go to movies. And that probably, you know, we're probably talking my sophomore and junior year of high school. I lived a few blocks from a, a 99 cent double feature movie theater, which doesn't that sound fantastic now? Um, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> I started going as often as I could with as many friends as I could, um, even sneaking into R rated movies just to see what all the fuss mm -hmm. was about. And, uh, I think at the time I remember being so unimpressed with R rated movies because I just thought they were stupid. I, I think I saw Pred mm -hmm. predator or something. And the story was just boring compared to the movies I loved and the books I loved. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess criticism became the way I learned to think about what I experienced. I didn't, this is a, a saying that a lot of writers have quoted, but I don't know what I think till I see what I say. Mm -hmm. And so when I sit down and start writing about my experience, I suddenly, I, I discover what I think about something. And oftentimes I'll see a movie and come out and go, oh, I didn't like that at all. And then I'll start writing about it and I'll realize, wow, I really admire this thing. Hmm, yeah. And and vice versa. I'll see a movie and and um, be thrilled with it, and then come out and start writing and realize that it just doesn't it doesn't really hold together when you when you think about it a second time. And that hmm. whole process fascinates me because we're you know the scriptures tell us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Mm -hmm. and that means to constantly be challenging ourselves to a, to a greater grasp of uh, what is that great Philippians four eight scripture whatever is good. True. Mm -hmm. Whatever is honorable, whatever is worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Yeah. And it doesn't say whatever is cute, whatever is nice, <laughs> whatever is safe. No, it says whatever is good. And just as there are great stories in the Bible full of terrible, terrible deeds and tragic ends, uh, so there are in, in, in movies, as in any form of art. Sure. And so I continue today because that's how I continue to learn. And and uh, I've met so many other critics and moviegoers with whom I have very enlightening conversations. Most people think movie critics are snobs that just argue all the time. But movie critics love to talk to each other because they learn all kinds of things. And they, their different perspectives uh, benefit one another. So while you may find the occasional snob who just uses criticism as a chance to complain about everything, I have found it to be, above all, a celebration uh, uh, and a challenge to learn more and more about what makes something good. I like that point that you made right there, just uh, redefining what criticism is. I think anybody, like most average people, when they hear the word critic, they figure, oh, I, it, it almost seems like the average person thinks that a movie critic doesn't really like movies that much <laughs> or a food critic doesn't really like food that much. And yet it's absolutely the opposite. People don't become movie critics typically, I imagine, anyways, unless they love movies. That's so true. I mean, when you look at Rotten Tomatoes and they divide those those reviews into audience reviews and critics reviews, most people look at that and say, okay, well, here's, here's moviegoers like me, and here are the people who hate movies. Here are the people whose job it is just to, to, come, to pick it apart. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. The critics are the ones who loved movies so much growing up that they couldn't stop talking about them, watching them, re-watching them, and then writing about them. Mm -hmm. And so if you see 300 to 400 movies a year and you write about most of them, surely your, your taste, your um, interests are going to be different than the average moviegoer who maybe goes to the theater once or twice a month um, and so to just write them off because you don't necessarily catch all of their references or because they have uh, a more demanding standard than you, mm -hmm. uh, I think is, is pretty naive because if you were to put the same kind of uh, dynamic, say, on the food world, that means you would have to reject the counsel of anybody who's concerned about nutrition or diet. Mm. Uh, or if you were to watch, as I've been watching lately, the Great British Baking Show. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> or, or, or any competition show, you would have to decide that the judges are monsters, mm. that there's no place for them, that they have nothing to say and their judgment has no basis. Mm -hmm. 
But in any discipline, the people who have the most experience and the most love for their subject become the ones whose opinions we want to hear. Mm. And that's as true with movies, I think, as anything else. And so the, the reputation that they're just snobs, I think, comes more from a place of not wanting to have the patience and the concentration to actually hear what they have to say uh, than it does from any actual observation of snobbery. Although, again, I will say there are a few out there who do promote that reputation. <laughs> Sure, sure. I wonder if it's even illustrative of uh, interactions with people in the church. Like, um, there are there are some people out there who will just want to complain about certain things, and then there are people who love the church so much, and who are heartbroken by some of the things it sees its church doing, that it can't help but speak out. Um, the Old Testament seems to have quite a few critics, if you will, um, or <laughs> that come in the form of prophets who... Yeah have some very critical things to say about something that it loves very much. Absolutely, absolutely. And the form of a prophet is not to make people feel bad so much as it is to say, course correct for your own good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I was just reading uh, some of the journals of, of Thomas Merton, uh, the, mm. the Trappist monk, and uh, he was saying uh, in an entry I read this week, uh, that he was beginning to realize that moral theology wasn't so bad. He'd always thought that moral m morality, that the, the subject of morality was horrible because people just use morality to judge one another. Uh, he said, mm -hmm. but the more I study it, uh, the more I realized that I got that impression from the wrong people, that morality, mm -hmm. is, morality is like uh, directions to help you get closer to Christ. And if you want to get closer to Christ, these are the ways that time and experience and good teaching have shown us uh, to find a life of intimacy with, with Christ. And so it should be something you're excited about learning rather than uh, something you throw down as a measurement so that we can judge one another. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, the same goes, the same. it's so similar to the conversation about criticism in movies. It's, it's such a delight when you rediscover something almost for the first time that you've been told or maybe you just misunderstood uh, being one thing and then you learn that there's so much more beauty and truth and goodness to it than you ever yeah. realized before. Yes, absolutely. I heard an explanation once, like, uh, if you... Uh, if there was one movie theater in your town and it only showed uh, romantic comedies <laughs> and you like, well, I hear movies are a thing and people like movies, so I'm going to go give this a try. And you tried and you tried and you just didn't like romantic comedies. You could probably walk away from that theater thinking, well, I guess I just don't like movies. <laughs> well, it's not that you don't like movies. You just those particular ones are not resonating with you because that's only putting out one type of movie, and yet there's so much more to movies than just that one genre. I teach a, um, uh, a, a class on faith and film at Seattle Pacific, and I also teach an academic course on research writing. And uh, I, I, I have fashioned that research writing course to be about movies as well, and in both cases, um, I... Uh, introduce students to movies that are celebrated around the world um, as some of the greatest ever made. Mm. And, and many of them are award winners from the Cannes Film Festival. Many of them come from other parts of the world than, than these students have ever seen uh, movies from before. And right away, you can, I mean, I can look out at the classroom and see just uh, struggle and frustration and alienation and mm -hmm. sheer boredom because they they are so used to what they get on American television, mm -hmm. which explains almost everything to you, which uh, delivers what you are used to seeing relentlessly. And then and then it seems shocking when they do something slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is a very American sensibility to just sit there and turn your brain off when you watch something, sure. which to me is like saying, I'm going to eat dinner, but I'm going to turn my stomach off. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, if you're going to get good things out of it, you need to digest what you eat. You need to process what you're watching, think about it, discuss it, ask questions about it. And so they come away from these films I introduce them to 
often just distraught, like, why did we have to go through that? Mm. Or why I didn't understand what was happening. Or um, I was so bored because there was no music or no action. Mm -hmm. But then when we reassemble for class, I start asking them for their impressions and I ask them what they noticed and I ask them what they liked. I ask them why this happened or why the camera was aimed at this angle or why the colors in this scene are, uh, are, are different from colors in another scene. And we start solving the mystery, so to speak, although we never solve it. We start um, discovering yeah. uh, what's, re what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And that's when they realize that a, a movie is not a puzzle to be solved. It's, it's more like a national park. It's mm. something to be explored, uh, explored in your own way. Uh, so you can make your own discoveries and compare them with those of others. And then it becomes something you want to go back to yeah. together or, or take your friends to and do again and discover more. And then you begin to realize that most of what we get through American media is, is merely entertaining mm. stuff to pass the time with familiar, pleasant sensations but art that's like nature that's that's a place uh that once you've had a taste of it you want to go there when you have a vacation mm -hmm. you you want to explore things and ask questions and discover things and so i can't say i always win my students over but by the end of the the class there's usually a handful of them who are saying well i mean none of my friends watch movies like this. I don't know anybody who does this. How can I keep doing this? <laughs> right. And uh, so you, then you have to say, well, sign up for another class or start a, start a film club or here are some websites or some online communities to join. Sure. Um, and it, it becomes like a secret society of people who know where the good stuff is. <laughs> yeah. I, you're talking about their uh, transition into watching these films. It, to me, describes my current existence because my wife and I are on a diet <laughs> and, uh, you know, whenever you start a diet, you, you feel that same frustration of, oh, what, why isn't this like what I used to eat? And then yeah, yeah. after you're on it for a while, hopefully, anyways, you'll come to a place where you're seeing the benefits of it and you're feeling better and you're feeling more aware and connected and all that. So it, it not that fascinating how art can do the same thing that physical nutrition, I guess, I guess it is, I guess it is all nutrition. It's just ones for the physical body and ones for the soul Definitely. or the mind. Definitely. Yeah. You know, we all had that first taste of coffee when we were a kid and probably thought adults must be absolutely insane uh, to punish <laughs> themselves by drinking this stuff, you know, and now most of us can't quit. <laughs> um, and we know that we, many, many of us know the nuances between different kinds of coffee and different ways to prepare it. And it's such a joyful uh, and, yes, expensive world <laughs> of uh, <laughs> ways, ways to sort of find your cup of coffee and ways to share coffee. And if you're like me, you're, you're crazy enough to enjoy the ritual of preparing it every morning. Mm. Uh, so... <laughs> um, these, these are acquired tastes, um, but there are reasons people, uh, give so much time and attention to them. In the interest of full disclosure, that is still a taste that I have not acquired myself. <laughs> well, you're uh, saving yourself a lot of money and you probably sleep better. <laughs> yeah. My, my wife loves it. I tried to get on board for like six months and I just couldn't do it. So. <laughs> wow. All right. So what was the first movie you saw in the theater? Let's see. In the theater, that would have to be uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, which uh, in the in the late seventies had a a sort of um, a victory lap. They brought it back to theaters, mm -hmm. um, and they do this with Disney films. They used to do this with Disney films. It was like every every ten or fifteen years they would bring back one of the classics for another run. Um, home video has kind of made that less. Mm -hmm. appealing although occasionally i mean we had a we had a jurassic park revival here a couple of years ago if i remember right and mm. uh, um so anyway, anyway they they took me to see snow white and the seven dwarfs because um they figured disney was probably pretty safe and they knew, they already knew that by the age of six i was i was just uh crazy about fairy tales and mm -hmm. so they thought well this would be a good one and i i can still close my eyes and remember uh specific moments in that specific theater um because it was such such a rush, um, mm -hmm. such an adrenaline rush of, of sensory overload. I remember the lightning uh, on the mountain. Yeah, yeah. And the dwarves chasing the witch up the hill. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, it was just like a year and a half later, two years later, that Star Wars opened. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember uh, mostly Disney films, um, but some other early ones. My first one was Beauty and the Beast. So oh, wow, yeah, yeah. Kind of in common. I, I went with a friend. Uh, you know, my parents had a similar hesitation early on about going to theaters and so forth, and they finally let me go with a friend and her his sister, uh-huh. and we got in probably a fourth of the way through. So, you know, I missed the introduction stuff, but I was just so taken by the movie-going experience. Yeah, and to be with that many people, there's there's sort of an added suspense when you realize that you're with that many people who don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah, yeah. Or, um, uh, it just gives you a, a strange sense of connectedness to people, much the way that I think liturgy can do in church, um, a sense that there are people all over the world reciting these words right now and praying mm. these things right now. And it gives you this strong sense of relationship and community um, beyond yourself. So mm-hmm. um, I th- it's too bad that we are losing so much of the communal theater experience. Uh, I think that's going to be bad for community in general. Uh, mm-hmm. So hopefully we can, hopefully we can keep theaters open. Yeah, it's a different, definitely a, not to be crass, but it's definitely a very different experience watching a movie on your cell phone while you're sitting on the toilet yeah. as opposed to going to the movie theater. <laughs> I can't say I've yeah. ever watched a movie on a cell phone. I think I would just be so aware of all the things I was missing. Um, yeah. But uh, but then again, for some people, that that's really you know they have to take opportunities where they can find them. So uh, you know, it, right, it, right. it would be. Uh, narrow-minded of me to uh, make some kind of huge judgment against that. (laughs) Yeah, usually for us, if that's the situation, it's because there's small child hands banging on the other side of the door. Mom, Dad! Sure, sure. Absolutely. (laughs) Do you recall a film that stuck out to you kind of early on that hit you on a spiritual level? Hmm. I think it's several films that struck out. Um... (laughs) (laughs) Sure, sure. Uh, Let's see. Usually Uh, the ones that were intending to strike you on a spiritual level. Right. Um, well, uh, I don't think at the time I thought much about it, but um, I, I mean, I write quite a bit in the book, Through a Screen Darkly, about the Muppet movie yeah. and how uh, since I first saw it as a kid, it has stuck with me. And it wasn't until much later that I started realizing uh, how much of that film's ideas about mystery and beauty and community and creativity um, have strong equivalents in the vocabulary of Christian faith. And even the lyrics of that great song, The Rainbow Connection, mm-hmm. um, have strong implications about uh, the connection between the Holy Spirit and creativity. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say, at, you know, if at the time, uh, a movie that I was, I was very, very aware of its, its uh, correlations with Christian faith, uh, was Chariots of Fire. And when that movie opened, my church that had been so critical about movies, suddenly everybody got up and went to the movies. And sure, um, sure. That, was, that was because there was a clear Christian character in the spotlight. Uh, he gave a sermon in the movie. Uh, he would eventually go on to the mission field. Of course, it's a true story, so we, we mm-hmm. knew that that was reliable that way. Um, but I think most importantly, Christians were so excited about going to the movies and seeing a Christian win. Mm. And so as as you watch Eric Little advance to the Olympics, and then you see him take a stand in the name of Christ there, um, this movie was bound to please Christians. And, mm. um, it, you know, I think it struck me even then, even it took a while to sink in, that Christians were okay with movies so long as we were seeing what we believed in and what we agreed with. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we had a sense that we were giving what we wanted to give to the world. And then it was okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And if the Christian comes out on top at the end. Sure. If they win a worldly award, even better. Um, And then it won the Oscar. Uh, And so Christians started acting like, well, this is it. This is the turning point. Christians are now going to have, uh, you know, an advantage when it comes to, art and culture, uh, which didn't really pan out, partly because I don't think we understood enough yet about art making to realize that that's a very well-made film. Mm -hmm. Um, Not only that, but we were conveniently ignoring half of the movie. Right, right. Which was about about 
another runner who was dealing with prejudice against Jews. Right. And the pressure of prejudice throughout his life had made him angry, and he was yeah. running to prove himself. And so the, the discussions about that film that I heard growing up were all about comparing the two characters, and the Christian guy was good, and the other guy was just all messed up because he was yeah. just so angry. Yeah. And now I look at the movie and go, this movie is incredibly empathetic, and it's an invitation to be empathetic towards both of these characters. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and to learn some to learn something from both of them, and frankly, the way that the Jewish character in that movie responds to persecution reminds me of the way an awful lot of Christians respond to criticism or pressure or attitudes that are different than theirs. And so, I think we had plenty to learn from him as well mm-hmm. about how to run a race well in those conditions. So I still look back at that film with a lot of admiration and affection, but probably not for the same reasons that um, a lot of other Christians do, uh, because that's a film that affirms the value of technical expertise in, in the matter of running. When I run, I feel God's pleasure. Absolutely. And that affirms that a creative work well done glorifies God. You don't have to preach. You don't have to... Um, uh, pin Jesus' name to everything to glorify God. But if you just do something well, you are reflecting the standards of God's own excellence. And that that mm. itself is a testimony and is pleasing to him. So when Eric Little's father says, you can peel a pot- or you can glorify God by peeling a potato if you peel it to perfection, those words have had a ripple effect in my life. I mean, so it's not just that that's a movie that spoke to me about faith that's a movie that changed my life sure. because that's that inspired me to become concerned about excellence in in the in the smallest things in a creative work and that has influenced my creative writing as well as my criticism um, but ultimately it has shown me that the path of art making or in the case of very little the path of running a good race uh, comes down to how you do the smallest technical thing, and you need to do that well if the whole thing is going to shine. So that's Chariots of Fire really stands out. Yeah, absolutely. And this this kind of opens up this whole other thing about there's this idea in Christianity that we struggle with where a work of art is only valuable if it validates our worldview and is over- overtly evangelistic mm-hmm. in its presentation. Um, where do you think Christians go wrong with this, this idea, and what are the negative consequences of engaging with films this way? Well, I mean, I want to preface anything I would say about that with um, the acknowledgement that I think we have come a long way with this. Mm-hmm. Um, 30 years ago, um, there was this subgenre of Christian movies, and that was the only thing that was okay, um, mm-hmm. because those movies preached the gospel. And that narrows the purpose of art to propaganda. That basically right. says a uh, work of art is only okay if it teaches you something that we agree with. Mm-hmm. And um, that contradicts Jesus' own way of telling stories. Mm. Uh, his parables never use the word Christian. His parables don't uh, divide people into the good guys and the bad guys and then say, look, the good guys win, the bad guys lose. Mm. His parables are stories about common people making decisions uh, in ways that reflect you know, their concerns and priorities. And they often leave some detail open, some loose end for you to chew on, um, mm. some kind of ambiguity that keeps the story from closing. Because that ambiguity, which uh, evangelical Christians have shown they just can't stand in art, mm-hmm. um, over and, you know, I'm, I'm making a huge generalization there, but in general, that is what I've observed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Jesus' stories leave questions hanging in the air. So that the prodigal son is not the story of a guy who did something bad and then came home and God forgave him. Mm-hmm. The prodigal son has a story about someone who made poor choices and who came home and was offered grace. But that was not a story about doing the right thing and winning God's favor. It was a story about irrational forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And yet, that, that's not the end of the story. The right. end of the story is all about the other brother. The end of yeah. the story is about the, the, the religious person, the righteous person who has mm-hmm. followed all the rules and who wants to see God judge the person who has not followed all the rules. 
And at the end of the story, uh, there's an empty seat at the party, and that seat belongs to, um, you know, the the religious figure, the the, the rule follower. Mm-hmm. And Jesus told this story in the presence of <laughs> reckless sinners and. Uh, who, and, I, and I should qualify, by that I mean reckless sinners in that their sins are wide open for everybody to see, mm-hmm. but he also told it in the presence of religious leaders who were criticizing Jesus for spending time with these R-rated people. Yeah. And so the end of the story, the sting in the tail of that story is for, in a sense, the sort of evangelical Christians of that day. It's mm-hmm. to say... You with your uh, morality, uh, you who are judging the creative works of people who are made in my image outside of the church are missing the point. Mm. Uh, I am out there loving them. I am out there listening to them. I am out there doing works in their minds and hearts. And so um, I think that evangelical art tends to come from a sort of cultural separatism. We want to we want to create alternatives to things that are safe and that tell us we are right, and that agree with the things we already believe. Right. Uh, but that ends up being, A, really bad art, because mm-hmm. it's preachy, and it doesn't have the mystery or the focus on beauty. Mm-hmm. Two, if, um, if, if there's anything imaginative or, or excellent in the work, you can almost always see how it's a copy of something that worked outside of the church. Mm. So if you look in the Christian music industry, although this is no longer uh, the prevailing situation that it used to be, but you can almost highlight, okay, here is the Christian band that sounds like Radiohead. Here's the Christian band. Here's the Christian rapper. So you don't have to listen to somebody as troubling as Kendrick Lamar. Mm. Um, (laughs) Although I have to laugh when I say that because Kendrick Lamar is a Christian. Mm. Um, Yeah. Um, we come up with all of these safe substitutes that will not challenge us, but that will give us the illusion we are challenging the world. Mm -hmm. Of course, the fact is that the Christian fiction section of the bookstore is not visited by anybody but Christians. Um, Mm -hmm. So this idea that we are creating art for the world that's better than what's out there, we're fooling ourselves. Christian movies are laughed at by the larger culture because they see... Uh, right through that cheap imitation they see right through the fact that this is this is more like a salesman showing up on your doorstep than it is somebody inviting you into an imaginative experience we don't go to the movies for a lesson right we go to the movies for imagination and there are there are secular movies that that uh, you can very easily see have an agenda oh yeah Um, absolutely i recall a, a certain period of time when like almost every movie that summer had something to say about environmentalism. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's not a worthy subject, but it was very clear that uh, there was an agenda, a purpose behind each one of these movies rather than just honest storytelling. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, these criticisms are in no way uh, specific to evangelical Christians. Any group that, that is zealous about the uh, its its message or its truth um you will see that group uh you know use these same tactics and mm. um i mean to me if you want to talk about environmentalism if you want to talk what what movies have made people care about the natural world uh when i was going to see peter jackson's lord of the rings movies over and over and over again i began to realize that i felt differently coming out of a screening of the fellowship of the ring than i did from other movies and eventually i realized a lot of it had to do with the fact that so much natural beauty was on the big big screen for three hours sure and i felt yeah. like I'd, i felt like i'd been to new zealand i felt like i had mm-hmm. seen i had been reminded of just how majestic uh creation is and that got me thinking, you know, if you want to make a movie that will make people want to take better care of the world, then you need to show them the world. Yeah. <laughs> make yeah. them fall make them fall in love with the world so they will want to save it. That will that will make such that will make a much greater difference than making a movie where somebody talks at you a whole lot about statistics. Sure. 
if you want to save the whales, take, take people whale watching. Yeah, you know? <laughs> absolutely. I'm pulling this anecdote out of the back of my mind, and so I'm probably going to get details wrong. But I heard a story. I recall I heard a story about um, you know you have the the charity efforts where they really kind of highlight the you know the starving children, and they show the pictures of the sunken eyes yeah. and um, and so forth to really show the suffering. I heard of a charity that went another route and they gave video cameras yes. to kids yes, absolutely, and let the kids play with them and go and have fun. And, um, I don't have the statistic on how successful that was, but I was at least drawn to the beauty of highlighting these kids as kids and playing and seeing their joy and seeing their world from their point of view absolutely. Um, and how that was such a beautiful way to, to, to do that. There's a great film that, uh, um, demonstrates this called born into brothels. Mm. Uh, that's about, um, uh, it, it's a documentary where a, a woman wanted to show the world, the horrible living conditions of prostitutes in India and the children that are growing up in those conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, but while she was there, she gave the ca gave her camera to a child and got pictures of that child's life that we wouldn't have been able to see any other way. And it was such a rich, uh, rich representation. You saw, you saw horrible things, but you also saw joy. You saw potential. You saw yeah. creativity. And so she started this effort to give disposable cameras before before digital cameras were on every phone. Um, to give them these little, you know, cheap disposable cameras and just sort of sent out this community of children with cameras and started taking the pictures back and made this movie that shows us uh, their world through their eyes. And that will make you love those children and that will make you want to do something about it. That's uh, so beautiful. you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And so I think, you know, it's not that, Christians are wrong about having a beautiful, having good news. The God, that's what the gospel means. Having good news for the world. Sure. It's, 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 it's in our zeal to share that, that we lose track of the, the importance of imagination. We lose track of, we we're so focused on um, a sort of scare tactic mm. uh, about heaven and hell that, we don't show people a Jesus that they will fall in love with and want to follow. Yeah. You know, Jesus was not somebody that people ran from. Jesus was somebody that you couldn't keep people away from. And it was because I think of the beauty of his vision and the kindness in his relationship and the imagination in his stories that were not like any they'd ever heard before. Yeah. And I think if we stop and look around, and see what draws people and what feeds them, then there's our model. Mm. So that's, yeah. I think, uh, I think we've come a long way. I think there are Christians in rock music and rap. I think there are Christians in movie making and, and fiction writing. I think there always have been, but maybe there, maybe and we've reached a point where they're not so scared to talk about it now. Um, mm -hmm. But you have Marilyn Robinson, one of the you know, great American novelists, who's living now and doing some of her best work now. Um, she's a professing Christian, but she writes with such high standards of excellence that she wins every award. Mm. Um, at the movies, uh, well, you just have so many. I mean, so many of the original storytellers from the, uh, the Pixar table yeah. uh, are church-going church Christians who aren't afraid to talk about their faith. Oh, Pete um, Doctor is brilliant. Absolutely, absolutely. Andrew Stanton. Um, mm -hmm. And that goes for every aspect of filmmaking, too. Uh, not just the directors, but the writers and the producers and the cinematographers. And, uh, um, Hollywood, which is so often just a bad word amongst Christians, Hollywood is full of Christians who are working at every level of the industry. So we can't mm -hmm. just blame Hollywood. We can't talk about how we need to clean up Hollywood. Um, we need to celebrate the good work that when we find it. And that means we have to find it. I mean, right. we have to be out there testing all things and holding fast to what is good. And what is good is not what's made by a Christian. Mm. What is good is what reflects the truth in beauty, because beauty is a, is an expression of truth. Mm -hmm. If somebody was listening who 
felt uh, compelled to be a filmmaker or a visual storyteller of some kind, would you, uh, and they thought, well, maybe as a Christian, my only outlet for that is going to be Christian films. Um, how would you, how would you encourage them to express the creativity that God has given them and also have their faith be a component of it? Like, what would you encourage them in that regard? Well, uh, I think, first of all, you have to affirm that any creative act is an exercise of that image of God uh, that, that you, mm-hmm. as, as a creation of God, as a child of God, reflect. So, um, again, if you peel a potato to perfection, it glorifies God. So if you film something beautifully, uh, that technical excellence glorifies God. Now, you do have to take into account the larger picture. Does this project I'm working on glorify God? Um, and that will be up to each individual and in their conscience, because we often don't know how a film is going to turn out when we're working on it. One person can come in and change change some editing, and it can change what the movie means. Sure. So you have to be patient with yourself. You have to give yourself a lot of grace, and you have to do the best you can within a context and and try to choose projects wisely. I would say be sure that you're surrounded with a uh, Christian community, Christians who will pray for you, who will discuss with you what's going on, who will be sort of accountability partners for you in your work. And this would be for anybody in any line of work anywhere. Yeah. Um, but then don't limit yourself to just working with Christians. For goodness sakes, we're supposed to be salt and light. I mean, those are words right out of the box, right out of the Bible. Yeah. And uh, salt doesn't stay in the shaker. <laughs> right, right. Um, you don't hide your light under a bushel, to go back to my Sunday school language. Um, mm-hmm. You you are seasoning in the world. So, you know, an assistant editor on a big, you know, uh, R-rated Hollywood movie can make a difference, uh, can make a difference in what that movie means, can coax out moments of beauty and grace. Uh, a friend of mine... Uh, was a producer on that 70s show, uh, the mm-hmm. sitcom. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a show that, I mean, it seems tame now compared to other things. Sure. But at the time, it was considered quite quite racy and quite, um, um, I mean, the characters were very, you know, the, the young people in the story, the, the, the young adults in the story were very um, free and reckless sexually. And so uh, not a film that was... Uh, popular, at least that they would admit amongst Christians. Right. <laughs> um, and he, he would get criticized all the time saying, how can you work on such a worldly show? He would say, well, I'm at the table and we discuss storyline. And I participate in those conversations and I influence the stories. Sometimes I win battles. Sometimes I lose them. Sometimes mm-hmm. I get to have a lot of say in a character's storyline. And when I do, um, Sometimes the decisions they made in a previous episode that seemed to be excused end up having consequences. Yeah, yeah. And so imagine, he said, imagine what that show would have been like if I hadn't been at the table. Mm, sure, <laughs> sure. That's being salt and light. That's being, because really this isn't just about the movie. This is about the community with whom you make the movie. Yeah. You are playing a role in their lives. You are, you are showing them a way of living that hopefully they won't forget that will, will come back to, to them later that may influence their decisions later. Um, hopefully they will see that there is something guiding you um, that they're hopefully above all, they will see that you have more joy in what you're doing than anyone. Mm -hmm. Um, Hopefully they will see there is a generosity of spirit and grace in you that is different than anyone. Hopefully they will not come away thinking, boy, that was a very judgmental person who criticized everything we did. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that, uh, you know, if you want to go into filmmaking, uh, it's going to be rough. It's going to be competitive. You're going to work with all kinds of people. You're going to work on projects that are absolutely terrible. And if you're lucky, you'll get to work on a project that does well. Mm-hmm. Um you're going to have to do it because you love it, because you love this work, not because you want to preach the gospel, mm-hmm. so to speak. Because <laughs> if you go into it, you know, without focusing on the excellence of the work, then you're not going to get good work, and your reputation is going to be terrible, and they're going to think, well, that was a salesman for Jesus in disguise. 
Mm -hmm. But if you go into it celebrating the work as a chance to glorify God with imagination and excellence, and you extend that embrace of God's glory uh, to other people in your generosity of spirit and your grace, uh, then you're going to make a tremendous difference, and people are going to want to work with you. Yeah. The Christians I know in the industry who do well and who get to be part of big projects are people who are wonderful company, who, who, um, who have a reputation for creativity and for standard-setting excellence and who avoid compromise, um, but who also, you know, they want to work with the best cinematographer, not the best Christian cinematographer. Right. Because ultimately that excellence is going to benefit the work in a way that will glorify God, mm. whether that cinematographer knows that or not. <laughs> sure, sure. So yeah. many of the most powerful movies that reflect the glory of God to me uh, do not, to my knowledge, have Christians working on them. Mm. It's, it's the story. I mean, for example, uh, the movie of gods and men, which is an incredibly powerful film about a group of monks who answered Christ's call uh, to lay down their lives for their fellow men and women. Uh, that film is one of the most beautiful portrayals of the gospel I've ever seen. Mm. It was made by an atheist. It was made by an atheist who was so moved by the story and was such a talented filmmaker and who worked with such standard setting people that the result was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. So God is working in the most unexpected places in the most unexpected minds and hearts. And he, as he did in the old Testament, when he built the tabernacle, he will bring the best craftsmen from the world not the best craftsman from that particular religious community. Yeah, and oh man, it's such a delight when you see God winking at you through something that you would never have expected. <laughs> Absolutely. Him That's to, so true. to smile through. Yeah. So what would you say to a young person or uh, to anybody who is moving forward in this craft but is going through the inevitable struggle of not being good enough yet? you know, and, and feeling down on that. And, um, well, I'm not the best at dot, dot, dot. Maybe I don't have a part to play. How do you kind of encourage that excellence while also encouraging those who are not yet there to keep going and keep working and, uh, have grace for their offerings as well? Um, stop watching the movies that you've seen, uh, uh, you know, stop, stop watching your favorite movies over and over and over again. And, or at least I don't stop, but, Start focusing on uh, films that win awards from people who know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, mm. You know, look at the international film festivals and see uh, what films win for cinematography. See what films win for screenwriting. Um, look at the most successful screenwriters and their work and read, you know, devour interviews with them. Um, uh, read not just the best Christian writing on film, but the best film journals to learn more about the craft, go to film school, um, take film classes, uh, pay attention to the films that year after year after year are still being discussed, not necessarily mm -hmm. by just Joe Friday night movie goer, but being discussed by the people who make great films uh, and start spending time with them. And that that can be really off-putting uh, at first because it's like learning a foreign language. You're not going to understand what you're seeing or what you're hearing right away. Sure. But if you put yourself in situations where you're surrounded by people who love this stuff, you'll pick up on the vocabulary and you'll start to see the difference between a well-made film and a mediocre one. Um, today. That sounds a lot like church. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Sure. You're well, entering it, into a situation. If you're not familiar with church, you're going to hear a lot of things that you're not familiar with that might be in it to an extent off putting. Um, and then once you spend more time with people who love the thing that church is supposed to love. Yeah. It, it's going to make more sense. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. And then I realize that, I mean, this is what you're asking of anybody that you invite to church. Uh, yeah. They're going to feel, overwhelmed and if there isn't you know, a lot of grace there they're going to feel judged um, mm -hmm. so many of my students um, 
feel about the church um, the way they feel about some of the movies that I introduce them to. They just feel like I, I just don't understand what all of us is about. Yeah. Uh, with church, that that's because they haven't had good teachers, or they have primarily focused on uh, Christianity as a system by which you know who is righteous and who isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to films, um, I have to be careful that if I introduce them to a film that is not what they're used to seeing on Netflix, or you know, uh, if they only go to movies about superheroes, they're probably going to be disoriented to watch movies about real people mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Sure. but um, um so much depends on on the grace and patience of the people who are introducing people to a new vocabulary right um as to whether that person is going to have the patience and want to come back uh, so today i showed a film by a couple of belgian filmmakers who win a lot of awards for their films but their their movies don't have any soundtrack any music uh, they uh, don't explain things in the ways we're used to. Uh, they just sort of throw you into a situation and you have to kind of get your bearings as the movie goes on and figure out who these characters are and what they care about, what's at stake. Um, you have to read subtitles. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, when the music isn't there to tell you how to feel about things, it can be very confusing and disorienting because you're like, i on what's going on. What, am I supposed to be sad right now? Am I supposed to be a happy moment? You have to pay attention to the details instead of just answering to the musical cues. Mm-hmm. And you know, one student fell asleep. Um, another one came up to me afterwards and said, I didn't understand any of that. Uh, a couple of other people I saw just on the edges of their seats, just like, what's going to happen at the end? They were so caught up in it. Mm. And I suspect they've probably seen a wider variety of films because this was not such a foreign language to them. So next week, I, if I'm a good teacher, I'm going to set aside a lot of time to walk them back through the movie and talk to them about how, how, thing, how it's put together um, and to help them see how every little detail was sort of whispering to them about what this movie was really about. Um, yeah. And we will see. I'll probably learn something from uh, their experience of it. Yeah. So one of the things that kind of come up in our conversation, and I know it's very important to you, is uh, the community aspect of engaging with films. And we've talked about how that that certain aspects of that kind of mirror the community aspects of church as well. And so as we kind of wrap up here, do you have any advice that you can give to churches about how they can take advantage of uh, the community aspect of engaging with films and also as it relates to uh, the building of the church? Well, I think uh, you and I experienced uh, a great example of this. Um, yeah. Christ Center Community Church um, in Fort Collins um, invited me to come out and talk about Through a Screen Darkly. And that was uh, such an honor and a privilege. And um, uh, very rarely have I been invited by churches to talk about the art of filmmaking. Um, Normally Mm -hmm. I talk at schools um, or at bookstores uh, or to film groups, but this was a chance to talk to a church about uh, about a lot of the things you and I have been talking about. But what, what I, what I came away most excited about was that the church uh, as a community was willing to sit down together and watch uh, movies from other countries, movies Mm -hmm. in other languages, movies uh, about uh, very different cultures than their own. We watched a film called The Fits that's about um, young African-American girls in a community center in Cincinnati uh, dealing Mm -hmm. with a strange uh, sort of epidemic that strikes their community. Yeah. Uh, that film, that that film wrestles with issues of, uh, economic status of, um, I mean, more ordinary things like teenage peer pressure, um, Mm -hmm. social media, uh, all kinds of things. But I think it's also operating on a very powerful level spiritually. Um, Mm we watched a movie that takes place entirely within a Muslim community where every single character is a Muslim. Um, mm-hmm. but that in that film, you have Muslims arguing with Muslims about, about faith, about what they believe, about what the right thing to do is. 
And you see a a community is divided and complicated and contentious and um, dangerous as the church. And uh, while I don't want to draw any false equivalencies, I would never say, you know, that all religions are the same. I think it can be very humbling for Christians to watch that film and see how how much of the trouble in that community mirrors the trouble we bring upon ourselves within the church sometimes. Sure. So for, for a church to have that kind of um, willingness to pay attention, loving attention to creative visions from other parts of the world, other communities and worldviews, and then, and this is the most important thing, sticking together for a few more hours to talk it out, to share yeah share different impressions of the movies, um, wrestle with questions about them together, um, have at least one person in the room, although I think we had, we're, we're blessed to have several who had some experience with different aspects of movie making uh, to talk about elements of craft. Um, and it sort of felt like we ended up watching those movies twice through uh, by the time yeah. we got through <laughs> the end of the conversation. Uh, because mm-hmm. we had looked looked so closely at so many aspects of them, and that is that felt like a good first step. And then I know that church went on to sort of have a mini film festival over the next several weeks, uh, mm-hmm. where people within the church sort of took up that template and kept following it. So uh, I would encourage churches to um, invite uh, people from their congregations who are involved in film, or to invite experts from outside. Uh, there's a great film critic named Josh Larson, who is a host of a great podcast called Film Spotting. And um, this is not a Christian podcast. Uh, He and a film instructor from uh, Chicago record these incredible conversations about film. And he's coming to Seattle to speak at an event at Seattle University. And I would love nothing more than to see him show up at some churches in Seattle talking about the art of film. So look Mm. him up. Uh, look up Alyssa Wilkinson, who is a film critic for Vox.com, V-O-X.com. Alyssa Wilkinson uh, was previously a film critic for Christianity Today, uh, as mm-hmm. I was once. And um, she is a great speaker and a great provocateur when it comes to conversations about art and faith. Uh, mm-hmm. Stephen, Grado- Stephen Gradonist, um is the film critic for the National Catholic Register. And uh, he also is a a great mind on the subject of faith and film. Uh, And he is particularly, uh, he he specializes particularly in in family movie going and and what what films are best for families to share. And uh, he's, he's one of my favorite writers and I've learned so much from him. So there are all kinds of people you can invite. You can invite filmmakers uh, like, I don't know, Scott Derrickson is the guy who directed Dr. Strange, and he's, a, he's not at all shy about his faith. Um, yeah. you, can, you can find people who have made great, big blockbuster movies and small, obscure, independent films who would love nothing more, I think, than to talk to Christians about the craft of filmmaking uh, in order to challenge them and teach them and inspire them. So some of the uh, community aspects of the post-movie viewing experience, um, their community building, they kind of almost sound like what churches try to do with small groups. Um, sure. And also in kind of parallel with small groups, if you're new to a small group, you might feel timid about sharing your experience or your perspective with these other people that you perceive to know more than you or they're more spiritual than you or whatever. And I can see people engaging in like a film discussion group uh, with a similar amount of timidity if they don't feel like they're as uh, connected to the film industry or as aware of visual symbolism or whatever as somebody else. Um, So I, I guess if you could give homework to somebody listening to this podcast, what's one thing that they could do uh, either something to pay attention to, to what they're already going to watch anyways, or something as they're looking for their, their next movie. What, what can they do to kind of build their movie palette, as it were? Well, I mean, you can start with, uh, I mean, right now, you could start with uh, what are the films that are, that are nominated for Oscars, and not just um, uh, Best Picture, but um, 
uh, best cinematography or best screenplay. And then round up a small group of friends and go see the films that are nominated and, and talk with each other about why you think they were nominated. Uh, and mm-hmm. then um, how, you know, appoint somebody in the group to print out several reviews, you know, maybe one from RogerEbert.com, uh, one from the New York Times, uh, one from ChristianityToday.com, and uh, either read those together or have everybody read them ahead of time and then get together and talk about them and see who you agree with, who you disagree with, uh, talk about what you learned from reading what the experts saw, so to speak, and um, talk about uh, what what Christian perspective can bring to this conversation. Um, mm. That This is what I do for fun. <laughs> you know, I round up a bunch <laughs> of friends and we go to a movie and we, we read reviews, we talk about them. Um, in the spring here at Seattle Pacific, I'll be teaching that faith and film class again, and that's what we do. Every Monday night, we watch a movie for two and a half hours. Uh, every Wednesday, we spend two and a half hours reading articles about that film, talking about that film, mm. filling out little questionnaires about that film, and then reading each other's opinions to each other. Uh, we we take the, the big whiteboard on the wall, and we sort of draw a map of the movie, where we put all the character names on the board, and we put themes on the board, and we put... Uh, we describe particular moments on the board and we draw lines connecting these things so that we can see what emerges as uh, what this movie has to reveal. That sounds fun. And those are some of the most exciting and rewarding times for people who love movies. And uh, once you get the bug, I hear again and again and again from students that what they got from that class was that they, they can't, enjoy movies the way they used to. (laughs) And it's not that they don't enjoy movies anymore. It's that they are not satisfied anymore with the stuff that they used to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, And it doesn't mean they won't watch it. I mean, I'm, I still have my favorites that I think are very silly or mediocre movies, but Mm -hmm. I appreciate certain things about, or maybe I just have good memories attached to them. Um, even the great filmmaker Terrence Malick says that his favorite movie is Zoolander, you know, that, that <laughs> ridiculous uh, Ben Stiller comedy about fashion. Sure. sure. Um, um, you know, I think we need to be honest about what we like and what makes us laugh and what we think is fun. Mm-hmm. But we also, bringing it back to food, need to challenge each other to make a steady diet of what is best yeah. and what is uh, what will challenge us to uh, become stronger. We can't eat ice cream all the time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's what most Friday night movies are on American movie theaters. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I encourage those those groups, those classes, those, those clubs, um, those Facebook groups, whatever it is, um, um, there's so much out there that can feed your conversation. And if you need a good list of movies, I mean, if you want to take on the heavy stuff and just dive right in, I would encourage you to visit the website for Image Journal, which is the best literary journal about the arts in the world uh, because it embraces uh, questions of of faith. ImageJournal.org is is the main website for that literary journal. But if you look over on the left side menu of of that website, you'll see a link that says Resources. Mm. And under that link uh, is a menu about film. And you will find there uh, a wide variety of lists, uh, the 100 great films about art, about art and faith, or the, the 100 great films about faith, mm. uh, 100 great, or 25 great films about marriage, 25 great films about memory, mm-hmm. 25 great films about grace or mercy. Um, they just published a new list of 25 great films about waking up, mm. about, about sort of waking up to what's true. Um, those lists are accompanied by small uh, commentaries. And, uh, well, I mean, pick one of those lists and you've got 25 to 100 movies to get busy watching and discussing. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. those lists, the, those lists are created by a, an ecumenical group of Christian film lovers. Uh, some of them are professional film critics. Uh, some of them are teachers. Some of them are pastors. I mean, it's, it's it's a wide variety of people who love film, and so you end up with a really intriguing list of of movies that some of which you'll find are familiar. I mean, there are some Pixar movies on those lists, and I would say probably most of which are are new to you because they're either 
50 years old or they're brand new, but they are, they came from a part of the world where you're not paying attention to those movies. So uh, that's a great resource that I recommend to everybody. You can also come to my website where I'm constantly pointing to these things. So. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. A, a, a resource I would recommend is your website and also your book through a screen darkly looking closer at beauty, truth, and evil in the movies. Um, don't you have uh, kind of towards the back, a kind of consolidated list of movies, um, even categorized in different uh, levels. Do I recall that correctly? That's true. Uh, that's true. The book is uh, several, several years old now, so uh, I need to uh, write another one and provide new lists. But there are also all kinds of lists on my own website, uh, which is lookingcloser.org. Uh, not lookingcloser.com, but lookingcloser.org. Mm -hmm. And uh, come to think of it, I need to, um, I need to post some news there about the, this new list that was just published at Image about movies about waking up. Um, and I just published my own list of my 30 favorite films from last year um, with commentaries on each one. That's fantastic. Uh, I can't, like I said in the beginning, I cannot recommend the book enough to anybody who has faith, who enjoys movies. Um, you said you're working on another project. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's probably in the beginning stages, but uh, is there anything that um, you're working on that you can tell us about? Well, right now I'm uh, I'm I, I'm still new at this uh, t uh, university teaching thing, so mm -hmm. I'm learning the ropes here and uh, loving uh, the students that I'm meeting and the chances I get to teach about these things. Um, but I am working on a new book about film. Um, I can't say more about that at this point, but the, um, but hopefully soon I will be able to uh, give you a good announcement about that. And uh, there's a new novel in the works. It's going very slowly just because I'm, I'm a very busy person. Sure. And uh, it, I find that fiction writing, the actual art making, is the most laborious work. And uh, I don't want to rush anything. Yeah. So um, and that's the problem is the more you're exposed to greatness in work from around the world, the harder uh, it, it is to finish your own because <laughs> you're yeah. so aware of, of uh, how how many different lenses can be put over what you've done. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm going to work on a, on a, on a novel, I'm going to spend a lot of time and try and make it worth people's time because there's just too much to read in the world already. Sure. <laughs> uh, but th yeah, those are the things I'm working on. And my website is always a work in progress. So. Mr. Overstreet, thank you so much for spending your time with us. I really appreciate it, sir. Well, it was a joy. Thank you. I hope to see you in person again soon. Ed. Absolutely. And thank you all for tuning in. I know you've been blessed by this and so we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the True Myth Podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, we'd love to hear from you. A like or a rating or a share or a bonk or shouting something positive out your window helps us too. For more information, visit us on Facebook or on our YouTube channel or visit our True Myth page at thewitnesscloud.com.